And now let's get started. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Society of Decision Professionals. We will begin with... Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to today's Society of Decision Professionals Learning Exchange. My name is Hilda Turetchen, and I have the pleasure of introducing today's presentation, Fundamentals of Decision Quality. I would like now to introduce you to the speakers you will be hearing from today. Our featured speaker is Dr. Bruce Judd. Dr. Judd has 40 years of experience as a consultant and educator in strategic decision making. He founded and directs the CG's executive education program, which helps clients develop internal capabilities to enhance the quality of their decision making. He currently teaches in the Stanford Strategic Decision and Risk Management Certificate Program, a partnership of SDG and the Stanford Center for Professional Development. He has held teaching position in the MBA program at both Stanford and Northwestern. Bruce is a fellow of the Society of Decision Professionals. Bruce, welcome to today's learning exchange. Thank you very much, Hilda. Thank you, Jay, for inviting me. I would also like to introduce you to our moderator for today, Jay Anderson. Jay is currently a senior research fellow at Eli Lilly and Company. Jay was a founding member, member of the Center. Jay is a founding member of the Decision Sciences Department and was instrumental in the design and application of the R and D portfolio process. He was a portfolio and decision consultant for senior management for 17 years. Since 2010, Jay has been the leader of the Strategic Competitive Intelligence Team. Jay is a fellow of the Society of Decision Professionals and a past board member. He is also a member of the Society's Program Council that brings the, uh, the webinars to you. Jay, welcome to today's learning exchange. Good morning, Hilda. It's good to be here. Jay will facilitate your questions throughout the presentation and raise some to our speaker to address live during and at the end of the webinar. And now, without any further ado, I'd like to turn today's presentation over to our featured speaker, Bruce Judd. Bruce, you may have the floor. Good. Thank you so much, uh, Hilda and, and uh, Jay, for inviting me. I uh, also have looked through the list of participants, and I see there are many colleagues, many friends, some of them going back over 40 years. Um, very honored that you're here. I'd like to greet you individually, but I can't, so I'll just say a collective hi and thanks for being here, and I hope I can make it, make it worth your time. We're going to be talking about the, the, the fundamentals of decision quality. The, the webinar has been designed for those who are relatively new to the uh, field of the decision professional. And when I say the decision professional, what I'm, I'm thinking of is those who support very complex decision making. And I noticed from the earlier poll that we've got at least 35% of you who are uh, five years or fewer in that profession. So we talk about complex decisions, those with, with very high stakes, those with multiple parties involved, with differing information, different objectives, and uh, unfortunately these are often in, in conflict. And so part of our goal is to help in that situation get to a high, high quality decision. My plan for the, 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 the talk is to cover these topics. Uh, first off, what are the fundamentals of decision quality? Number two, how do you apply it uh, in an organization, especially to complex decisions? Number three, how do you coach the senior people in the organization, those who can probably benefit the most from improved quality in their decisions? Uh, how do you coach them on decision quality? And then finally, we'll, we'll summarize of where, where you can learn more. So I like to think of, of decision professionals uh, guiding senior executives through some very complex decisions. And this grid divides the complexity into two dimensions. One is the analytic complexity, the uncertainty, the, the very complex interrelationships, interrelated decision criteria, multiple players in, 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 in competition uh, and, and, and potentially uh, where, where game theory can, can help uh, get insight as to what's a good strategy. 
Now, we haven't talked about the other dimension yet, but if you're low on analytic complexity and low on organizational complexity, how do we make decisions? Well, it's common sense, it's rules of thumb, it's, it's governed by experience. And we know, we tend to know what works. If we are deep into the analytic complexity, that's where the field of decision analysis has a set of very defensible, logical approaches, uh, easy to follow procedures that will give you, give you the, the right answer, so to speak if it's formulated properly. Now, those of us who were in graduate school and studying decision analysis just love to, to sink our teeth into some of these analytic complexities and a problem. But there's some equally gnarly issues uh, over in the other dimension. Uh, we call it organizational complexity. This is where you've got many people involved. They're often in conflict. They have different views on how to frame the problem different levels of power and, and resources available to them. You've got uh, organizations where the decision has impacts across a business or across a, uh, a nonprofit organization, and you need to draw on the expertise from various parts of those organizations. You've got geographically dispersed teams, uh, and then often, unfortunately, uh, limitations in decision process. Uh, one of the biggest that, that we see is a, a culture of what we call perpetual advocacy, where individuals are strongly committed to a particular path that often differs from someone else's commitment, and uh, spend a lot of time and energy advocating for one path or the other. At the end of the day, it's, it's often the person with the best PowerPoint who, who uh, wins the day and, and gets the, the choice that they want. But that's not always, in fact, it's usually not the most value-creating alternative. And there are other problems, biases uh, that, that people have, and, and simply limited time and attention working on the decision problem. Now, if you're low on analytic complexity but high on organizational com complexity, uh, some good facilitation, we call it decision facilitation, is very focused on getting to a decision efficiently, and that's sufficient. You take the decision making group off-site and uh, work through with a facilitator. <clears throat> but if you're in the upper right-hand corner where you've got high complexity on, on both needs, then, then, then you need something more. And uh, that's what this discussion is going to be about when you're in that upper, upper right-hand corner. So when it comes time to make those decisions in the upper right-hand corner, how do, you, how do you know you're making the right choice? If you're making a strategic decision, in other words, choosing the right road to run on, uh, you're like the character we show on the left. If you're managing operations, then basically what you're doing is deciding how to keep running well on the, on the chosen road. Now, if we're on the right, making routine and operational decisions, we use our experience and the ability we have to adjust to conditions if the, if the initial choices aren't right, usually the time horizons are short enough that we can make adjustments. But on the, the left, the very long-term strategic decision-making issues involved, and, and they require something more. And that's where we came to the, uh, the notion of decision quality. Now, the, the symbol we use for decision quality is this chain. And each of the six links in the chain represents an element of decision quality. The first one in the lower left is, is getting the right frame. In other words, what problem are we trying to solve? What opportunity are we trying to address? Who should be involved? What are the dates by which decisions are needed? What's the right scope? Uh, the decision frame is all about getting the right people working on the right problem in the right way. Number two is getting creative and doable alternatives. And, and when I say creative, what I'm thinking of here is alternatives with a creative stretch beyond the obvious. Things that are truly doable, but they're also compelling and they can build, build lasting value for the organization. When we're talking to senior level people, we use the phrase that this is a, a surefire way for you to create more value is by engaging significantly in the early part of this process where you're 
uh, generating these ideas for, for alternatives. In fact, what we've often found when we do an analysis and evaluate the alternatives, those ones that are truly a creative stretch can easily double the value of the, of the choice when it's made. Number three, meaningful and reliable information. This is information that's material to the decision. It's based on appropriate data and facts. It is the, uh, not only a statement of what we know, it's also a statement of, of what we don't know. In other words, the uncertainty is included. That's number three. Number four is being clear about our, our values. In other words, being clear about what we want. Uh, establishing criteria for that. If it's a business context, then building shareholder value is something important, and the metric we can use for that is net present value of, of cash flows. If it's a, a more public-oriented decision, for instance, stamping out malaria, uh, then, then the criteria and the metric might be disability-adjusted life years saved or dallies. We need to get clear about that. In number five, the the link here, the element, is logically correct reasoning. And here's where we use decision analysis to evaluate, going back now to number two, to evaluate what we can do, and then number three, in light of what we know, and then number four, uh, in, in, in also in light of, of what we want, in other words, the values. If those other elements, number two, number three, number four, are established carefully, and they fit within the, the appropriate frame for the problem, then doing the analysis may not be the most difficult step. That may be relatively easy uh, after you've you know, fought the battles of getting clear about the others. Um, however, when things get really complex and the analysis isn't so easy, that's where we need to focus on what are the insights that we can learn from analysis that help guide decision making. And that brings us around to element number six, which is commitment to action. If there's no commitment, there won't be any action. If there's no action, then we really don't have a decision. So that's, that's number six. And when I think of, of the decision, I also think of, of some level of organizational readiness to implement the decision and also the resources in place uh, that, that, are, that are necessary for that implementation. And you can ask, and I, should, I should say, by the way, that this is not a process. This is more of a snapshot of the strength of the chain at any point in time. And then the question is, what's the, what's the most important link? Well, it is a chain. And, and like a chain, the overall quality is no stronger than the, the weakest link. And we use this, this concept, this frame, framework of decision quality, as a, a, a framework for guiding conversations about what's the quality of a decision at any point in the decision process. It could be right before the decision is made, but it also could be early on. And the nature of the conversation that's held is what's the level of quality that we have now? Is it sufficient? If it's not sufficient, where do we go next? How do we build additional quality? And in order to discuss or to quantify that, we use a spider diagram. It has the same six elements of decision quality around the outer perimeter, but it's, it's a quantitative scale. Zero to 100 percent is shown here for element number five. And the team has that conversation. Where are we now on each of those dimensions? Is it adequate? And if not, what do we do to, to bridge the gap out to 100 percent? Now, if this is relatively new to you, you're saying, okay, what's 100%? And let's take meaningful, reliable information as, a, as an example. Uh, it, it's clear that you can't get 100% of all the information available in the world in spite of our search engines. You can't get all of that information in time for the decision. So 100% doesn't make sense as the point of all the information that's possible. Uh, maybe it's all the information you have. Well, that doesn't make much sense as a, as a 100% point either because you may be able to, with some expenditure of resources, gather additional information. So the way we think of the 100% point, it's where we've reached diminishing returns. The 100% point is where additional effort to gather more information, for example, costs more than it's worth. 
an important concept to think about. Is it worth doing more work, or do we have enough information, clear enough values, good enough alter alternatives, enough analysis in order to make the decision right now, or do we need to do more work? The whole point of the decision quality chain is to overcome many of the impediments to decision quality. They're listed around the outer edge of the chain here for appropriate frame. I guess the most common one we see is either the wrong people involved or the wrong view of the problem, maybe an inadequate scope. Uh, alternatives, oftentimes, they're just missing. There's only one alternative presented rather than a compelling set of, of multiple alternatives that need to be evaluated and can compete one against the other instead of pitting individuals against each other, we'd like to see the alternatives compete in terms of value creation. Number three, uncertainty needs to be included, and the assessments, the data, the facts that are brought to, to bear need to be grounded in reality. Getting clarity on values and trade-offs, number four, uh, simply not being clear about the criteria. I was giving a course earlier this week in, in portfolio analysis, and I was asking the organization that was represented in the room, so how are portfolio decisions made here? <laughs> it's very clear. A group of decision makers go off-site, uh, close the door, sit down and discuss and make choices about what gets funded and what doesn't get funded, but they really don't communicate the basis for that decision. So it's very hard for the organization to figure out what's the right set of alternatives, what are the right set of projects that will build the most value for the organization, simply because either they haven't thought it through clearly or it's not communicated. The analysis piece uh, goes everywhere from we're too simplistic in our analysis, uh, we're using rules of thumb that aren't so good, all the way to the other extreme. We've got analysis paralysis. And then number six, we just don't have alignment among our decision makers, and as I said before, no commitment means no action and therefore no decision. So those are the elements of decision quality. Here's a poll for you. Uh, for the strategic decisions that you support, what's the weakest link in the decision quality chain? Please click on the choice that fits best. Is it frame? Is it getting good alternatives? Is it put meaningful, reliable information? Getting clarity about values and trade-offs? doing the right level of reasoning and analysis? Is it gaining the commitment to action? Or are they all equally wrong, <laughs> equally weak? If you're a glass is half full kind of person, they're all equally strong, is the word I was looking for. All right, so we're looking at the polls, and it's interesting that about 40%, I think the popcorn has stopped popping here, so let's close the poll, about 38%, of getting the right frame. And in my experience, the reason this often happens is we skip over that step. We don't identify exactly what is the problem we're solving and what's the most appropriate one now. Bruce, this is Jay. Mind if I jump in with a question? Please. I noticed that the number two on the list is commitment to action. Is this also been your experience that uh, it's a place of weakness for many of our decision makers? Now, good question, Jay. Uh, as I finished my graduate work and came out with uh, steeped in the knowledge of decision analysis, I figured that would be all we'd have to do is do a good analysis. Everybody would sign up for the decision that it recommends. Uh, the, the problem is that's only half the story. We've got to work on the dimension, other dimension, and getting those individuals involved early in the process so that they not only trust the process, they trust the people that are in it, and getting credibility into the numbers that go into that analysis, that's a huge step. And if we tried to short-circuit any piece of that, getting them involved, getting the trust in the people, getting the trust in the process, and getting credibility into the numbers, without that, you're just not going to get commitment to action. So, yeah, that's consistent with my experience, too. Okay, thanks. All right, next topic. So how do you apply this? Well, the right approach to decision quality depends on the nature of the decision. We make hundreds, maybe thousands of very quick decisions in a day. Uh, we could call these everyday decisions, or they could be emergencies. And what we need here is automatic 
response, reflexive response to the decision situation. If, if we were in a movie theater and someone yelled, fire, we've learned through having good habits that maybe we're not immediately going to follow the crowd. Let's look around for another exit, another alternative. Let's move up the scale now, the, the more complex nature of the decisions. There are fewer of these. We call them significant decisions. They're important, but they're, they're relatively easy, or they're complex, but not as important. These are, are decided in hours, from beginning, maybe the identification of a, of a problem in a manufacturing area, identify the problem, get to the choice as to what's the best approach to solve it, maybe a matter of three or four hours. What do we need here? Well, some moderate, deliberative effort. Uh, maybe even the pencil and paper to sketch a few numbers, sketch out a decision tree, sketch out a list of alternatives. And here what we found is this chain, the elements of decision quality, can serve as a checklist. Then we get to the more complex strategic decisions. They're much more difficult, and there are many fewer of these. These are decided in a matter of days or weeks or months. What's it take? Well, I like the word rigor, a rigorous deliberative effort that addresses both the analytic complexities as well as the organizational complexities. And here we've got a little red icon of a decision process. I'll describe that in just a minute. And then the familiar icon of the chain, which is the goal, to come to a high-quality decision, but it takes days, weeks, or months. Very few of these in an organization's uh, com you know, compared to the other, other, other two types, very few of these. So let's move on then to a process that we've evolved over, over 40 years of one that is, is making uh, the decisions in, in, in very complex situations. I've illustrated here two timelines. One is uh, a, 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 a labeled at the top a decision board. Now, that's the generalization. It could be a collection of people. Uh, it, there are methodologies uh, abbreviated as RACI, R-A-C-I, or RAPID, R-A-P-I-D, that help identify who are the key people in the decision. We'll collectively call this the decision board and decision makers. And I realize in many organizations this needs to be one person, and it could be one person, or it could be a set of people who need to agree on a, on a choice. This set of people has all the authority they need. They have all the power they need. They have the resources they need. Unfortunately, they don't have the time they need to do all the homework that's necessary to come to a high-quality decision. And that leads to this other team at the bottom of the diagram called the project team. And then there's a set of interactions between the board and the team uh, initially to recognize there's a situation that needs a decision that could be recognized by the project team or by a decision board. The team assesses the situation, gathers information if needed, comes up with an initial frame of what's the right scope, what's the perspective, what's the timing, who should be involved, an initial frame for the decision. Then there's a meeting between the project team and the decision board, and the objective of that meeting is to agree on the frame. It's for the decision board to say, yes, that fits for this situation, or no, we need to adjust that. It can be a short meeting, but it's absolutely essential, and the decision maker's engagement in that is critical. Next step, let's take that frame, and the project team works, maybe there's some decision maker involvement, to develop a set of alternatives, get clear on values, start to gather information to assemble that into uh, a set of alternatives and information that fits within the frame. Then there's another meeting. Meet the decision board. We've got, let's say, four alternatives. One, two, three, four. Alternatives, uh, uh, the decision board says, you know, alternative number one and number two looks spot on. Those, those fit for us. Number three, we don't like it. We wouldn't do it. It's not feasible. I don't think we could execute it. So a set of reasons why they, they want to drop that alternative. Okay, we won't give it a whole lot more attention, but they might want to add number four and number five to that initial set. So there's an agreement on the alternatives, and then we begin in earnest evaluating them using a set of tools that's right for the situation. Maybe it's very simple little spreadsheet with 10 or 15 lines, simple little decision tree, or a very complex model or set of models 
for instance, when you're looking at a portfolio of R&D projects. The evaluation is done. Out of that evaluation comes uh, uh, quantification, if you will, of each of the uh, alternatives and their, their rewards and their value, uh, their risks, and a set of insights as to what are the relative strengths and weaknesses of each one of these. At that point, the decision makers have enough information to make the decision. Maybe there are two meetings involved here. Maybe there's just one. Make the decision, and then if it's a major change in strategy, here's where there may be another effort by a project team augmented by implementers uh, who plan the implementation, the budgets, et cetera, and then agree on, with the decision board, agree on the right path forward. This whole process is designed to do multiple things. One of them is simply to build confidence on the part of the decision makers. Second, to provide insight. Third, clarity on which is the best alternative. And that set of things, confidence in the process, insight, clarity, leads to alignment and then commitment to a high-quality decision. The decision professional has a set of tools, and there are many, many, many more tools than you would use on any particular decision. For the frame, we've got to use the, the right set of organizational tools, if you will, meetings, discussions, information gathering, to get to alignment on what's the right situation for this decision, how do we view it, what's the scope, and what are our value measures. Then alternatives. A lot of ways to approach this, creativity methods. Another way is simply to identify what are the major challenges that face us. The set of challenges can be the, the stimulus for generating alternatives and gathering information. The evaluation. Here we want to look at the alternatives quantitatively, look at their risks, look at their returns, and some insights into which is best and why. And then if needed, a planning stage where we get budgets and plans and operational responsibilities for implementing the strategies as we go forward. Bruce, I got a clarification question that just came in. Um, one of our uh, listeners noticed that in your evaluation bubble, you've got a, an arrow that goes right to the decision board and then back, whereas the others are kind of like rounded but don't actually go to the decision board. What's the distinction you're trying to draw there? Okay, thanks, Jay. Uh, in the uh, frame and alternative, there is a meeting with a decision board and an agreement as to frame or alternatives. The evaluated alternatives that terminate in an arrow pointing to the decision on the preceding slide uh, indicates that this may be the stopping point. You make that decision and go directly to implementation. But for more complex ones, there may be another involvement on the part of this project team and another meeting with a decision board simply to line up the people, the responsibilities, and the budgets. It's a subtle distinction, um, but, but it does work in many situations when the decision itself is, is the end of this project team's involvement, and then we shift into implementation mode. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. All right, so, so how do you get through that process? Well, we often, uh, in, in most complex situations, have someone that we'll call a, a decision leader, and different organizations call this person different, different things. It could be a decision scientist, could be a decision support, could be a decision professional. The key is that this person is playing a very important role with both the decision makers and the project team. Let's first look to the left. What is the role with the decision maker or decision makers? Um, this decision leader has got to know the, the organizational context within which all of this fits, uh, understands decision makers' perspectives. And for someone who who's grows into this profession out of the field of analysis, this may take some, some experience and some learning to understand their perspective. Uh, you keep a finger on the pulse of the decision makers, maintaining open communication throughout the process. You don't get too busy on your other tasks to close off that communication. Keep it going. Constantly monitoring changes in the decision situation, and you know when to change course. Let's, I've had situations, for instance, where the head of that decision board, the, the VP that was in charge of a particular decision, uh, got a new job assignment, and there was a new vice president coming in 
uh, from Brussels, Belgium, into the States to uh, take over. Well, it was time to change course. It was time to stop the existing process and get the new person involved before we made a, a lot of additional headway without uh, her leadership from coming in from Brussels. Uh, and then finally, you've got a, a big role to play synthesizing the insights from the project team's work uh, clearly and with incisiveness. Uh, what about on the other side? Well, here's an equally important role with the project team. You're the project team leader often. You design and oversee the activities of that team. It takes a, a good bit of experience to, to get to that right, that proper design uh, without wasting too much time. Uh, again, you're monitoring progress and you know when to change course on the project team side. Uh, you're taking responsibility along with the project team for quality and you managing the resources and schedule. So it's quite a full load, which which brings us to another poll. Uh, we've got uh, people here with three to five years of experience or greater than five. In fact, it's interesting that about half of you had greater than five ex years experience. So what, what I'm looking for here is where do you spend most of your time? Please click either on managing the board there are some of you out there in the audience, I know you're real specialists at doing that. Uh, you're managing the project team, so far about 50%. They're about equal, or I do neither. Those for whom it's equal, congratulations. <laughs> They're both big, important tasks. All right, so let's close the polls. We've got here 45% uh, in managing the project team. Yep, there's a lot more meetings, a lot more work to be done there in terms of physical hours, and so this uh, vote from, from you all reflects that. Okay, so we're going to move on now to say where does all this fit in the complexity that we uh, grid that we established earlier. Well, for the ones of, of medium analytic and organizational complexity, the decision quality chain fits well. If it's uh, up in the upper right-hand corner, that's where we need uh, the, the more complicated dialogue decision process. I want to quickly give you a little perspective on, on how do you coach senior decision makers on this. And without the demand from the top, decision prof professionals are often doomed to frustration. Um, common first reactions, hey, come on, from the decision board, we're successful. Our decisions must be good ones. Or they look at our process, it takes too long, our business is high velocity, we make the best decisions. Or how about this one? I've been brought in to rescue this corporation. I've been brought in to ensure our future. I know what's best. How about this one? Just bring me the data, I'll make the call. Or this one, I'm sorry, but I don't see how any of this is helpful. As our two colleagues down at the bottom are showing, this can be severely frustrating. So, so what works? Well, let me turn that around. What what doesn't work? How do you how do you win the support and sponsorship? Uh, we suggest avoiding the following. Um, you, the decision maker, you're not a good decision maker. I'll make you better. That doesn't fly, and neither does this. Your track record is you're making bad decisions. You're just not willing to take risks. Or let's take the analytic view. Look at all the robust models we build. Or here's a great decision tree, Monte Carlo analysis. This is the solution to your problem. Look, senior people have a very tough job to do, and they generally believe they're skilled decision makers. How else would they have reached the top? So here's a completely different frame on what works. In fact, this is taken from our society website. I'll give you the site in just a minute. It's the Decision Maker's Bill of Rights. Instead of saying you're not making good decisions, it's, hey, we know you've got a tough job. You've got the right to a frame that structures the decision in a context most relevant for your needs. You've got the right to creative alternatives. You've got the right to relevant and reliable information. You need to understand, and you've got the right to understand the potential consequences, even though they may be highly uncertain. You've got the right to a logical analysis that allows you to draw meaningful conclusions and get to clarity of action. And finally, you've got the right to call in a facilitator to help you get alignment and commitment to action. Now, this is certainly not unique to, to SDG. In fact, our moderator 
Jay Anderson and his colleague, longtime colleague Jim Felly at Eli Lilly and Company uh, evolved this approach and found it effective. Uh, visit our website, the Society of Decision Professionals. There's the link. You can download these slides that, that has that link listed for you uh, at the conclusion of the presentation. So once you've won the support, then, uh, in other words, the, the uh, willingness of senior people to say, hey, we, we demand our rights, then after you've read them their rights, then coach them. Well, what are the right questions to ask? When we're doing a one-day executive workshop for the most senior people in an organization, this is the set of questions. It's a longer list, but you can evolve ones that are right for your organization. What's, what is it that we're deciding? What are our choices on information? Do we have the information we need on values and trade-offs? What are the consequences that we really care about? Have we made them explicit? Uh, are we thinking straight about this? And then finally, will we really take action and what could change our minds about proceeding? Coaching the decision makers to ask questions and making them good at that is a real, a real key to success. One thing we need to keep in mind is our, our brains are not wired to arrive at the most value-creating decisions. Nobel laureate Herbert, uh, Herbert Simon said, you know, our human nature is to satisfy. Our decisions are good enough. In fact, for a lot of people, a good decision is when they can get alignment. And once you have agreement around a choice, then you uh, pat yourselves on the back for how well you decided. Thanks to Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky for this insight. And by the way, if you haven't read Daniel Kahneman's most recent book, Thinking Fast and Slow, I urge you to do so. It's a tremendous uh, insight into the psychological side of our profession. So in, in reality, when we, we delude ourselves into thinking we're, we're good enough, we, we actually are leaving often a lot of value on the table. Consequently, our goal as decision professionals should be to help our decision makers discover these shortcomings and then demand decision support. It's their right. What's the gold standard? Organizations that says we regularly make high quality decisions. We've got good processes and tools in place. We've got the good understanding of our roles and we've got the right skills. We are aligned in our organization. Chevron one of the benchmark organizations, in my view, of, in the oil and gas industry, says decision analysis or decision quality, it's in our DNA. And number five, we continue to, to learn and get better at decision competency. Uh, here's what we found is a, a, a success template for getting an organization on the path to decision quality, briefing for the people at the top, pilot project to show the power, some awareness training, both for the executives and for those involved in the process, then more projects, the gnarlier the better. And the role of the decision professional here is, is to work, lead that process, and then be coaching others so they can become process leaders. Uh, ultimately, many organizations form a self-sustaining internal DQ center or a program office. Uh, and it, I'm not going to go through them now. In fact, we'll skip the next poll because I want to get to any questions we have. Uh, but there's a set of challenges, and we often talk about these in the context of from to. We need to get our culture from the items that you're going to be seeing on the left to the items you're seeing on the right. What the question is, what's, what, what is the most challenging with your organization? And we'll leave those to download to you. I'm not actually going to go through this, this next poll. In the spirit of learning, where can you learn more? Well, it's one of the roles of our society. There's a career ladder for practitioners, for lead practitioners, for fellows. It's on our website. There are programs that organizations like Stanford University. We have our certificate program in strategic decision and risk management many analytic courses, many on the organizational side, and a sister program in project management, and then lots of consulting organizations and educational organizations that are part of our profession have a variety of, of programs that are available to you. Uh, if you want additional information on building DQ in your organization, my email is on the slides that you can download, bj.sdg. On other topics of, of interest, please contact uh, my colleague, Keoko Matsunaga, and her email is there also. Whew. 
I'll skip this poll. I want to go back to Jay. What uh, questions do you have for me? Well, Bruce, we didn't really need to go that fast as we actually have until about quarter till the hour, and it's just about 20 after right now. If you want to go back, we could uh, do that other poll. So I've long since lost my ability to do math. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I thought we were ending at half the hour. No, um, that's just when uh, your presentation is done. <laughs> lots more time. So, so we talked about three levels of resources, and let me go back here to uh, the Society of Decision Professionals. There's the Certification of the Career Ladder. Uh, there are programs like those at Stanford University, those at Tuck, those at Duke, others where you can uh, get mid-career training on the skills, et cetera, and uh, a, a, a set of organizational uh, organizations do consulting, uh, as as does SDG education and training. And I'm, I'm curious to know how uh, these have been useful to you. So here's our poll. Which of these have been a, a uh, resource for you? You can click on either Society, the Stanford Certificate Program, other organizations, professional programs, training programs, uh, internal resources within my organization. Jay, I know you and others have, have built training capabilities within Eli Lilly over the years and, and, and to, to very good effect, or combinations of the above or none of the above. Okay, let's close that poll. And uh, as we might expect, about half combinations. And it's interesting, uh, still only around 9% on the Society of Decision Professionals. And that's one of our goals is to is provide resources for you. So we can encourage you to use even more of that. All right, so I would like to come back to one other element here, and I'm clicking back quickly. Um, I want to go back to this slide on the, the, the from and the to and, and, and just get you to reflect for a minute on what some of these challenges are. And as I go through these, I'd like you to think of what's, what's the type of change that would be most difficult in your organization? So, on the left. Decision maker impatience. Time lanes are, are somewhat arbitrary. I, I'm the decision maker and I'm going to leave for Tahiti in a week and a half. I want the decision before I go. Uh, there's no time to do it right, but always time to, to do it over. Uh, we've got to get from there to let's focus on doing it right the first time. Decision maker says, by when can we have it done right? If that is the biggest challenge, make a note number one. We'll do the poll on the next slide. Number two, and boy, I see this a lot. The decision maker is quite happy to engage in the final decision meeting, but not in earlier meetings, even on very complex decisions. They're too busy to engage in a discussion about frame and alternatives. Now, these are long-term strategic decisions. I don't know exactly what they're doing with their time. They don't have time to, to engage on this, but it's a common problem. Uh, we'd like to get to a state where the decision maker owns the frame and alternatives discussion, considers them his or her opportunity to make a very high-valued contribution. That's number two. Number three, uh, simply looking at the, the, the menu of decisions that are coming up and, unfortunately, deciding on them only when an absolute deadline looms. I know somebody who had a... Uh, a weekend, basically decide whether to put in a bid for an organization that was suddenly putting itself up to sale, for this for sale. And this decision maker said, you know, I, I decided to be at bid somewhere around $3 billion on a Sunday morning over coffee. Well, what I'd rather see is a strategic decision agenda. This is the two on this number three, where, where we identify in advance, what are the major decisions that are coming up during the year, and we proactively manage that agenda so that we get to the, the most complex, highest value opportunities in the right order. 
Number three, we've got a frame on cost. We want to get to the recommendation quickly and cheaply. Uh, some organizations obsess over the cost. Other organizations that have made a real uh, uh, contribution to this field and get real value out of it, focus on value. Where, where might we add more value? And let's not leave too much value on the table by being too hasty. Number five, number five I'm sorry, a frame of advocacy. Come on, defend your proposal as opposed to an inquiry, uh, a frame where the decision maker stewards a search for the highest value alternative. Number six, missing an opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, that's rarely visible. Missing a target is highly visible. Uh, uh, Warren Buffett, when asked, what are your biggest investment failures? He said, you know, it's the opportunities that I let go by. And there was something there that was in my circle of competence, but I failed to act on it. And that's cost our shareholders billions. We call these errors of omission. They ought to be valued equally with errors of, of, of commission. In other words, doing something that we shouldn't have. Uh, and then number seven, uh, defining a good decision as a good outcome. One of the fundamental if not the most fundamental tenet of decision analysis, that a good decision is independent of the outcome. Uh, n the number seven, the two dimension here is a good decision requires decision quality. A uh, good decision will always be good. A bad decision can never be good, and the outcome, you can make a great decision and still have a bad outcome, and vice versa. All right, so what do you think? One, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. Here's a poll. Number the red one, decision maker impatience. That's the hardest transformation for our organization. The blue one, decision makers not present. The yellow one, no strategic agenda of decisions. Green one, total focus and obsession with cost instead of value. The purple one, advocacy, not a value frame. The orange one, errors of omission are ignored. Commission are highly publicized. They ought to be treated equally. And then finally, simply not getting commitment to action. <laughs> Which of those? Well, it's looking almost even. Maybe this is a good time to, to close that poll. This is where uh, there's no question they're a challenge. And for many of you, probably all of the above uh, might have been might have been the uh, might have been the answer. Um, it's interesting how deeply in our organization ingrained advocacy can be. And you know, when you're implementing a project, being a strong advocate, having an advocate is essential. Having a champion is essential for getting the implementation done right. But when it comes to making the strategic decision, better to have a value, value frame. Okay, sorry to do that a little bit in order, but <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. Jay, what do you have? Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, so far, we've just uh, got one uh, question in our queue, so I encourage uh, our participants to go ahead and type in their questions. Uh, Bruce, our first question is uh, relates to something you talked about earlier in your presentation. And the question is, how often is the basic underlying issue that many executive decision makers don't want to lose control of the decision? What do you do when you're in a situation like that? Yeah, uh, first we've got to recognize that that they don't want to lose control, and that this whole process could be perceived as handing over decision authority, either to two or three others that I've represented on the decision board, or to the the, the set of analysts who are going to uh, determine what the decision maker ought to do. And of course, we we, we work hard to uh, avoid that. I try to have one-on-one -on -one time with those decision makers up front, especially the first time they go through this process, to understand, get them to understand that it's their decision, it's, it's, it's their frame, it's their set of alternatives, and to use the, the words that you and, and Jim Felly came up with, it's their right to have this support. At the end of the day, it's their decision. I found this to be the biggest problem the first time through. Once an organization has started using this process and once some senior people have had the experience of realizing that they're not losing control, but instead they're, they're being 
simply forced to think through what are the consequences, uh, it leaves them in a much better position. There is a, um, a video that we put up on our website recently by Bo Smith and, and Norm Chambers, who were Brown and Root when this process was first applied at Brown and Root and now in subsequent organizations. And they say, you know, it forced us as decision makers to use our right brain and our left brain, and I know that distinction is blurring these days, but but it forced us to do both, uh, to get creative, to get logical. It forced us to be better decision makers. Uh, it didn't it didn't take the decision making authority away from us. Okay. Um, our next question has to do with the uh, decision dialogue process, and as you know, that snakes back and forth between the decision maker and the decision team. The question is, what about the gap in getting access to the decision maker for a dialogue in settings other than the infrequently scheduled formal decision making meetings? Yeah, it's tough. Uh, their, their calendars are booked solid. In fact, just getting those three or four decision meetings in itself is a real challenge. And I reckon, I recommend not getting started on the process until you have commitment from the D, as they say in some organizations, from the decision maker to, to, to make those those meetings happen. I was once giving a, a, a briefing to uh, the entire leadership team minus the CEO. So it was a COO and, and all the direct reports to CEO. Uh, and my sponsor said, Bruce, don't talk about that, Jay, you called it the snake process. That's what we yep. call it, the snake process. Don't talk about that too much because you simply can't get on their calendar and you're talking about having three or four meetings instead of one meeting. And I said, well, I need to talk about it a little bit. I got through the briefing the next day. We got to that snake process. And right when I got to the point of, of the decision, the most powerful guy in the room pointed at me and pointed at the slide and he said, stop right there. And I said, uh oh, I was warned. And he said, that's what, that's what's wrong with our organization. And I, I kind of gulp. My throat goes dry. And I said, what a good facilitator will say is, we'll say more. He said, you know, I've been here for 42 years and I've learned a thing or two. The people around me, they take direction on some initiative. They go off and they don't check in with me until the end of the process. I want to check in along the way. I want I want to contribute some of my knowledge. And that was on a Friday. On a Monday, he gathered everybody together. We're doing initiatives for him. And he said, this is the way we're going to run our business. We're going to have these periodic meetings. So, again, it's it's getting over that initial hump. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, the cork's out of the bottle now. We've got uh, quite a few questions that are coming through. So our next one is, how often, in your experience, is decision quality used in making strategy and business model decisions in startup businesses? Mm, not as frequently, simply for lack of time. Uh, one of my uh, very close friends and business partners, Tom Rice, left the decision analysis world and, and went to be a, a venture capital. And he said, you know, I use it daily in my head, but we don't often build complex Monte Carlo simulations, uh, even when designing the strategy for our startup. Uh, it's simply a question of time and resource availability. The principles are useful to him, but not, uh, not the actual process. But once the organization starts to get into a more, more complex situations, and we have a lot of former startups that are highly successful showing up at our courses over at Stanford now, uh, once they get into that more complex, organizationally complex decision-making setting, that's where they start to use it a lot more. And I imagine that some of the problem is that some of these startup groups are rather small in and of themselves, and as small organizations, less likely to be exposed to this approach to decision-making. Yeah. Our next question is, what would you ordinarily cover in your one-day decision facilitation session? Okay, good. So the participants here are people with significant decision authority. Uh, we actually uh, start off with a demonstration that many of you who are out there are decision professionals use where we give them an opportunity to take a little bit of risk and talk about a little bit about the, some of the principles of decision analysis 
uh, get them started with a fun game, and then we talk immediately about decision quality, similar to what I've done in, in this session, talk around that chain, let them know their decision rights, and challenge them with questions to ask. So that's the first major topic. Then these tend to be organized, when we're invited in, they're organizations that have very complex decisions. They're starting to use that dialogue process. So the remainder of the day is stepping them through uh, an introduction to the dialogue process, framing and giving them a, a, a case exercise to go into breakout groups and, and solve that. Next, an alternatives exercise using tools like strategy table, and then number three, evaluation. We give them the evaluation results, and they ask the questions that we taught them in the morning about the quality and the reasons behind some of the risks and values that they see. And then we actually conclude that one-day workshop with a from and to exercise, as I just went through, um, allowing probably 30, 40 percent of the time throughout the day uh, devoted to discussion rather than PowerPoint. Okay. That would make for a very full day, too. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> now, this next uh, question uh, is something that uh, caused me to lose some of my hair as well, and that's uh, how do you get organizations to separate the decision from the outcome? Yeah, Jay. How do you get organizations? <laughs> how do you get Eli and Lily to separate those two? I'd be curious. Well, I'll tell you, one of the things that's very difficult is in an organization uh, for which successes are rare and the people that are associated with successes tend to be rewarded. Um, then it's even more difficult to do that. Um, that's one of the things that we address in our internal course, of course, is to talk to participants about uh, how you can have a very good decision that leads you to have a bad outcome. But I've seen many examples of executives who still uh, don't appreciate the distinction between those two. Yeah, there's two things that go hand in hand, I think. Uh, and, and you're in an organization where, where successes are really big when they happen, but they're few and far between, between mm -hmm. the pharmaceutical business. But two things that go hand in hand. One is being willing to admit that there's risk and uncertainty and quantify it and include it in your decisions. And then the second half of that is the willingness to, to, to separate decisions from outcomes. Talk with Frank Cook about what was so successful for him at Chevron over the years. And he said, you know, as our decision executives over the 22, 24 years they've been doing this, as our decision executives became more comfortable with the numbers, with the quantification and the uncertainty ranges, they were willing to take on more and more and more risk simply because they understood it better. So when I say hand in hand, it's understanding what are the risks and then realizing that we've got to, that was what I taught my daughter when she was learning soccer, you've got to take a lot of shots on goal and you're going to strike and score if you take enough of them. Okay. Well, there's a... We, there's a lot of questions in the queue, but there's three in particular I'd like to get to before we have to sign off. And uh, I think this will all resonate with uh, people that are just starting out as new decision facilitators. The first is, how do you deal with the intimidation factor when a senior vice president is telling the decision analyst that there is no faith in the decision quality process and would rather base the decision on a gut feel? Mm -hmm. uh, one on one before. I think that it's a critical conversation that, that you as the decision professional need to have with that person. They, at the end of the day, have to be demanding this, it's their right, rather than you trying to push it on them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what happens when that happens in a group session? Yeah, your mouth goes dry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had the number one guy in the room at one point simply point at me and say, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's not only the, the decision process this guy didn't like, he didn't think I knew much about the, about the problem. And so, uh, stay cool. Uh, a question, the decision makers often believe that they know the right answer. They know the right direction. So here's a question that I ask. 
are you open to consider other alternatives? Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, this this is probably not a worthwhile activity. If the answer is, well, yes, then proceed. Um, another quick question, How have, have you found a light process, kind of like a decision quality light, that investors, and in particular venture investors, use that is based on decision quality? Yeah, some, uh, Tom Keelan uh, and, and Michael Mishkariz are two people that left SDG some years back, formed a, uh, an, an organization that serves the biotech industry. And... Uh, they have evolved a set of tools, a set of relationships with investors, a set of relationships with startups where this decision quality process, including some of the analytics, gets gets applied routinely. Now, has SDG evolved that? No, because we tend to be a consulting organization and we tend to work on, on really big, gnarly problems. But our clients have often established DQ light. Now, the thing I always caution is if the problem that they're addressing, if the opportunity they're looking at truly deserves the full process, the the, the full fat latte, if you will, instead of the non-fat latte or, or reduced fat latte, if it, re- it deserves the full process, you're leaving value on the table by not doing it. So you've got to have a very good triage process to decide when is it appropriate. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time, unfortunately, and I apologize to all the other participants who had questions that we just didn't get to all of them, but I do need to turn it over to Hilda at this point in time. Bruce, thanks very, very much for uh, being our featured speaker this month. Jay, thank you so much. Well, we hope you have found this webinar informational. It is with the support of our community that we are able to offer this event. And to be able to continue to offer value presentation, we invite you to pay forward by visiting our website. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's learning exchange. I'd like to thank our presenter for their time and contribution to today's event. I want to remind you that you can download a copy of today's presentation by clicking on the handout icon in the upper right of the menu bar, selecting the file, and clicking download. Alternatively, you may select from the bottom right menu, print to PDF. Thank you for being with us today, and you may now disconnect.